Welcome to Harmony United Methodist Church for our virtual online worship. This is our service for the weekend of October 3rd and 4th. It is our celebration of World Communion Sunday. And as such, I invite you this day to have prepared with you as you are celebrating. Have some food and drink around as we're going to offer an agape feast, a love feast, later in the service during this time. So take a moment now to prepare that for yourself for our celebration. We are glad you can be with us during this time of worship. And I want to thank David Elliott and Matt Cole and Elaine Stuckey for being here and offering this worship time for you all. We thank you for joining us in this worship as we worship God together. We continue to offer worship in the sanctuary on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock, and we invite those who feel comfortable coming in to share in that worship here at the sanctuary. We are continuing to pre-record our worship services for Facebook and YouTube, and we are premiering those at 9 o'clock on Sundays for the time being, but soon we may turn that over to a live-streamed event, in which case we may change that start time to the same time of our Sunday morning worship services. So please pay attention on our website and Facebook pages. We will announce when that change does take place. If you are watching during the premiere time and on Facebook, we invite you to share messages with one another and your prayer requests can be offered during that time and on Facebook as well. I'd also like to invite anybody who is interested in learning and helping us with our audiovisual system uh, to come to the church and, and learn about our new camera setup and the computer system for our live streaming of the worship services. We're hoping to put together a small team of folks who can rotate through and work through our live stream events together. So please consider that prayerfully discern if that's a ministry you can help us in this future time. Next week is our week when uh, Mac McWilliams will bring his car around. We, if you have paint, newspaper recycling, you can bring that into the church beforehand. We can load that in his car at that time. And we also this week are sending off our, our United Methodist women to enjoy a few days of retreat at Cape and Springs. And so we ask God's blessing upon them on their time in retreat. So let us prepare our hearts to worship God with our prelude music.
Good morning. Welcome to Harmony Methodist, United Methodist Church. I'm Matt Cole. We'll now have our call to worship, inspired by Psalm 19. God of all it is, seen and unseen, receive the praise from our mouths and the meditations of our hearts. The heavens above and the ground below proclaim your handiwork. Your precepts are right and your commandments enlighten the eyes. Your law revives the soul and your decrees make wise the simple. Your ordinances are like fine gold and sweeter than honey. Lead us to keep your instruction where there is great reward. Praise, Praise be, be to God, God our, our rock and our, our redeemer. redeemer. Amen. Amen. Exodus uh, chapter 20 verses 1 through 4, 7 through 9, and 12 through 20. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of, your, of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days later you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not cover, covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witness the thunder and the lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. May you be blessed in this holy word. Thanks be to God.
Please listen this morning for our gospel lesson. We're reading out of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. May you be blessed in hearing this holy word. Thanks be to God. Friends, what can we do to live our lives as children of God? To live with hope for the resurrection through the firstborn of the resurrection, Jesus Christ? What can we do to live for God's promised new creation of the new heaven and earth? This question is key to our Christian identity and a key to that ages old question, what is my purpose? Friends, we can find answers in both the Old and the New Testaments. The prophet Micah wrote, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? And having just read the words of the Ten Commandments from Exodus, you might recognize in Micah's answer to that question a very neat summary of the Ten Commandments when Micah answered, Do justice. Love, kindness, and mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Likewise, from Matthew's Gospel, we just read Jesus' simple yet thorough summary of the Ten Commandments and all the Torah law when he named the greatest commandment in this way. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let us pray. God who delivers, receive our praise. Fill us with your spirit that we may be inspired to serve. Through the glory of the triune God we pray. Amen. Followers of Jesus Christ have long encouraged one another to live so that others would recognize something in them that you might not see in the average person. You might witness something that the ordinary citizen does not possess, and that something is worth a second and closer look. Now, I trust that our basis for living beyond the ordinary is that Christian li the Christian lives with hope. Particularly, the Christian lives with hope for God's planned future. And by trusting in that hope for the future, we can live with a hopeful heart and mind in the present. And when we live lives of hope, we can act beyond what is ordinary and standard. So what does it look like to live with hope in the present? Well, hope looks like Calm courtesy and civility when others are running around shouting, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Hope looks like forgiving your neighbor after your neighbor drives over your mailbox. Hope looks like running an errand for your bedridden neighbor. Hope looks like collecting and distributing food to a hungry family. What gives us this hope? What gives us hope that we might live our lives somehow differently than our neighbor? What gives us hope to live with grace for the stranger, for care for our community? What gives us hope to offer forgiveness for injury? Hope in the present. That is, hope that positively guides our words and actions. Hope in the present needs a solid foundation. Hope needs to be grounded firmly or it fades and erodes away. 
Hope that is placed in the temporary is itself temporary. And hope that is placed in the error-prone works of people will be subject to errors. But hope that is placed in the solid foundation of God's promise of resurrection and the new creation is hope that endures. When we deeply trust in the future promised by God, we naturally live according to the hope for God's promised future. Indeed, those who fully and deeply trust God's future promise do not think of that as a promise or as the future, but they see God's revealed works and God's new creation as part of the here and now. They live as if God's new kingdom is already revealed. Beloved, we Christians are people of the resurrection. Our hope arises from Jesus' resurrection, his being raised from the dead, and we can trust that Christ's resurrection and being raised from the dead is like the down payment to fulfill God's reconciliation of the world for that new creation to come. So this month, I pray we all attend to our reading of scriptures with that idea firmly in place, that our promise from God is that promise of God's resurrection and the promise of being raised from the dead and that promise of God's new creation, the new heaven and the earth. And when we trust that promise, that we participate as disciples of Christ for the world. We come to trust God's promise when we practice, when we put our head and our heart and our hands to work in discipleship to love God and to love our neighbor. And so we return to the question, how do we live secure in God's mercy and hope for the world? Well, let's return then to the teachings and the examples of the Old and the New Testament to give us all the foundation that we need. Now, we could look to Genesis and say, life is to be lived according to the image and likeness of God, but that can feel a bit vague and imprecise. It's especially vague if we don't really know what it means, God's likeness. So we might look at some particulars about living, and in the Exodus lesson we read today, God had such compassion on that wayward people who'd escaped Egypt, that God taught them ways to live that would keep them in good graces with one another and in good graces with God. God gave those Ten Commandments with this intention, so that you do not sin. Recall, the people's ancestors had lived under Egyptian rule for centuries. Now, no longer under the rule and reign of Egypt, they would have to learn how to live together, how to govern one another, how to distinct, distinguish responsible living from harmful living. And so the Ten Commandments taught them about actions that would break their relationship to God. Those Ten Commandments taught them about things that could break their relationship with one another. And they were taught these so they might live, so you do not sin. God did not impose the commandments to bring harm to the people, but rather God's commandments intended to bring an understanding and a sense of order to the people's lives. That they knew what to expect, that they would not be afraid. So they could learn to discern their actions, that they might set aside harmful actions and live according to healthy actions. Now the Ten Commandments were not altogether the end-all and be-all of goodly, righteous, and just living, but what they did is they set the standard. They set the standard by which other questions of behavior and faith and living might be compared. For instance, just because the Ten Commandments doesn't say anything like, thou shalt not commit arson, it's no excuse to burn down someone else's property. For setting fire to someone's property and stealing property 
result in the same outcome to the victim, who no longer has access to that property. The Ten Commandments offer a solid foundation for living responsibly in community. And by living according to that, the social framework can stay together. And when society treats all persons equally, justly, and amicably, the social framework is more secure, hope becomes more secure. Now, in the writings of the New Testament, the notion of the Ten Commandments as the complete guide for goodly and righteous living is repeatedly challenged. It is challenged both in the epistles and in the Gospels. That in 2 Corinthians, for example, Paul pressed the Christians to live beyond the Ten Commandments as our foundation. For Paul had described the covenant of the Torah law and the Ten Commandments as the ministry of condemnation. While Paul then described the new covenant made through Jesus Christ as the ministry of justification. And so Paul wrote this. If there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, much more does the ministry of justification abound in glory. Indeed, what once had glory has lost its glory because of the greater glory. Paul taught that the old covenant of the Torah that was centered on the Ten Commandments had been standard teaching until Christ came, yet for persons whose lives were transformed through Jesus Christ, the Ten Commandments will feel restrictive and dull. The greater glory is to live in the freedom of Christ, for Paul wrote, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. This reconciliation comes to us through Jesus' death and resurrection. But let me be clear, Paul does not reject the Ten Commandments and the Torah law. Instead, Paul sees them as diminutive and dull when compared to the greater glory of Jesus Christ. Indeed, we read about this. That while many of the Ten Commandments are written in the negative, thou shalt not, Jesus' summary of the greatest commandment is written in the positive that Jesus spoke, you shall love your Lord, the Lord God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus' teaching brought the fullness of the law under one umbrella, under the positive message to love God and to love one another. When questioned, Jesus did not name one of the Ten Commandments as the greatest commandment, but he named the underlying standards on which all of the commandments rest. Jesus taught us this as a simple yet complete answer for how to live according to the image and likeness of God, that is, love God and love your neighbor. Christ's teaching gives us that foundation for a life in hope and trust. And that foundation rests on trusting God to fulfill the promise of the new creation and the resurrection. And when we trust Jesus' teaching, we can feel hope in our hearts and minds to live according to God's love. But while hope in our hearts and our minds, our minds can be easily distracted or confused or forgetful. And if you're like me and you see brokenness throughout the world, your hopeful thoughts can get brushed aside by frustration or anger or irritation or a deluge of information and images of conflict. And so hope that comes without renewal or substance or growth is a transient hope. 
It may be here in church or when gathered at home on a Sunday or other days of the week when we worship together, that we pray and sing our hymns, that we hold hope tightly. But how long before that hope slips away? Therefore, how do we live that we hold on to that hope day in and day out as children of God? We sustain hope and trust through our practice of discipleship. And discipleship is participation. That participation makes hope last longer, and it renews our hope, and it sustains our hope. When we participate in discipleship, we are actively growing in hope. When we practice discipleship, our hands act from a hope in God. And then that hope resides deeper and more fully in our hearts, and hope becomes rooted concretely in our heads. When our hands are involved in ministry, when we actively will and work for God's good pleasure, we are growing the very roots of hope within us. So, beloved, when we trust in God's resurrection and the new creation, we secure our foundation to live lives of hope. When we, live, when we hope in God's new creation as if it were here and now, the foundation becomes even more secure. And when we practice acts of discipleship, our foundation of hope and trust is continually reinforced. Therefore, orient your lives away from sin. Orient your lives to focus on God and daily practices of discipleship. So when we live to will and to work for God's good pleasure, we move ourselves towards the kingdom of heaven. We reveal God's new creation to those around us. Therefore, to live your lives as children of God, place your trust in God's promised resurrection, place your hope in the new creation, and live your trust and hope by loving God and loving your neighbor. Thanks be to God. Amen. For the remembrance 
of God's goodness as the foundation of our bright hope for tomorrow, we pray. Lord, have mercy for the healing of this nation and all nations in turbulent times, we pray. Christ, have mercy. For the healing of the millions who are afflicted by the COVID-19 pandemic, for the President and First Lady, for close relatives and friends, we pray. Lord, have mercy for our faithful witness to strengthen a love of God with all the heart, all the soul, and all the mind in the people we meet, we pray. Christ, have mercy. And for the joys uplifting our hearts and the concerns weighing on our souls, we bring all before you and ask your blessing on each according to your goodness, we pray. Lord, have mercy. Friends, this day we celebrate with World Communion Sunday with brothers and sisters of the faith throughout the world and for our celebration, virtually, we offer this time as what we call the love feast or the agape meal. We will continue then our time of worship in a time of communion with brothers and sisters in Christ. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. That in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. Amen. Having confessed our sin before one another and before God, we are in a time to share the peace of Christ with one another. Virtually or with those around you, I invite you now to share the love and the peace of Jesus Christ. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. And at this time, I would like to continue to thank the congregation and our friends for all of the support we've been able to bear together and share here with Harmony United Methodist Church, that from the fruits of your generosity, we've been able to offer a space for ministry and mission. We've been able to feed the hungry and take care of the poor. Today, I'd like to let you all know that during this time of the pandemic, we have continued to offer support to groups in the community that, that are supporting one another, groups like Alcoholics and Anonymous, who have been able to continue to meet out in our pavilion outdoors and in smaller groups indoors. We give thanks to all who are able to supply through your offerings this opportunity to care for one another. I invite you this week to continue to offer your support to the mission and ministry here at Harmony by sharing your offering and your gifts. Let us reflect on that as we hear the word, hear the music of our doxology. The gifts of your breath of life, your commandments, your grace, and your redeeming love through Jesus are worthy of our thanks and praise. We offer you our thanks and the first fruits of our labors. 
receive our gifts as signs of our faith, hope, and love in you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Friends, we enter a time of our great thanksgiving for celebration, and we give thanks to God for the mercy, justice, and grace. It is right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, holy God, creator of heaven and earth. For you formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with all your people on earth, and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, who was anointed by your Holy Spirit and preached good news to the poor, proclaimed release to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce the time had come when you would save your people. With love and faith we remember the Godhead, whom Jesus called Abba, Father, as the architect and creator of heaven and earth. With love and faith, we remember Jesus who taught and healed, proclaimed and sojourned with all manner of people, and who died and was resurrected for the sake of human salvation. With love and faith, we remember the Holy Spirit who breathes life and mercy over creation, and who comforts and encourages us in faith and hope and love. Let us proclaim together with confidence the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, may the triune God, life-giving and life-renewing, source, Savior, and Spirit, bless you with grace, and bless your agape meal of food and drink, like bread and wine, in remembrance of Jesus' act of pure love for us. Therefore, eat and drink now of your agape meal. And as you do, remember, you are united through Christ with brothers and sisters throughout the world. And together with the whole body of Christ, receive Jesus' love that he freely gave to you. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for Jesus, who gave himself to us, as we remember his pure agape love for us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your Spirit, to give ourselves to others in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, go this week with this blessing. Remember, you are a beloved child of God in the worldwide community of the body of Christ. Be blessed by the love of Christ. Be empowered in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit as you go into the mission field to share the gospel of Christ's eternal love. Amen. Amen.